Mrs. Nye, could you please do our roll call? Here. Thank you, Mrs. Nye. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to our January 13th, 2021 regular meeting of the Governing Board. Um, would you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and then please remain standing uh, for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Please be seated. We have some routine business to um, go through this evening. First is to approve the minutes of the January 4th, 2021 special board meeting. I've not seen that there have been any um, additions or corrections to this, so could I please get a motion? Madam President, I make a motion to approve the minutes of the January 4th, 2021 special board meeting as presented. Second. All those in favor of approving the minutes of the January 4th, 2021 special board meeting, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Dr. Castile, um, is there any correspondence? Not this, well, there's plenty, but it's all in your board packet, so. <laughs> Thank you. Our next is to approve and ratif uh, and approval and ratification of payroll and expenditure vouchers. Could I please get a motion? Madam President, I make a motion to approve and ratify payroll for the December 17th, 2020 and December 31st, 2020 and current expenditures. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of approving and ratifying the payroll for December 17th, 2020 and December 31st, 2020 and the current expenditures, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. This evening we have a number of citizens comments. Um, what I'm going to start with is um, a presentation from Mr. Locke who has collected um, a lot of our online comments. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Castile and guests tonight. Uh, we heard from 457 people this week who took advantage of the opportunity to provide feedback to the governing board electronically. This complements the citizen comment section that requires individuals to come to the district to fill out a blue form prior to the start of the meeting. That, that complements the in-person. Also with this format, it allows the district or the board to review feedback in advance of the meeting to give them time to process the information and ask questions to administrators. We're providing the responses on the governing board website for all to see in an effort to maintain our transparency. Uh, topics addressed this week, including the following, school health and safety mitigation, the COVID dashboard, social and mental health, support for return to in-person uh, learning, non-support for return to in-person learning, academic concerns, offer uh, stay, in, stay in virtual learning, uh, thanks to the school board for all you're doing, uh, teacher, staff safety, evaluate on social, by, uh, on school by school level basis, choices, criteria and surveys, communication, governing board and meetings, athletics, and support for hybrid learning environment. You have uh, all of the submissions verbatim for your consideration. And as I said before, they're also available for review from the public on our website. Thank you, Mr. Locke. This evening, we have more than 30 um, different people who would like to speak uh, to us this evening. And so we will be limiting uh, the amount of time that you have till one up to one minute. Um, Dr. Nance will be uh, timing, and I believe that you will be seeing um, the timer up on the board. And after- They can't show it on the board for one minute. So oh, they can't show it on for one minute. So um, you'll just have to uh, listen for uh, Dr. Nance's calling out. Um, well, Dr. Nance, could you call out at 45 seconds and then um, they can complete after 15, within 15 seconds? 45 seconds? Yes, please or 45 and then one minute. 
15 seconds later. Thank you. Um, so I will also be um, reading the person who is first up, and then I will call for an on-deck individual to be ready to um, uh, speak secondly. So our first person tonight is Heidi Gass, and our second person is, it looks like Michelle Swartz. Yes, go ahead. Madam President and members of the board, I am a former CUSD parent, current grandparent and CUSD teacher of specials of a Title I elementary school. I'm asking that you bring our elementary school students back to in-person learning and be that district of choice. Teachers are essential workers. We belong at school with our students. Our students struggle with online learning and many don't have technology and or Wi-Fi at home. I myself have spent a lot of time with families helping them get their technology going in support of virtual learning. I have helped students try to understand how to use the devices at home or get them onto these devices um, at home. Our drop-in program at my school is full. The students attending need more help than just seconds. supervision. With the amount of students we have on campus, we might as well be in person. I'm aware of the dangers of COVID, but I feel like with mitigating factors, I can wash my hands and take care of myself. I understand there are teachers who do not feel safe coming to school, and Time I know expired. there's no easy answer. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Swartz is next, and Ella Choi is on deck. Madam President, members of the board, my name is Michelle Swartz. I'm a math teacher at Castile High. I'm also the math department chair and a former CUSD parent as well. First of all, I'd like to say I feel most safe at school. It is the safest place I am. It's safer than my home because my husband's an airline pilot. We have plenty of cleaning supplies, more than we could ever use. All the kids wear masks. All, it's a simple reminder, they pull it up. The kids are very compliant. We are most hurting our at-risk students. Our ELL students, our SPED students, and our students that simply struggle at school are most at risk and they are falling further behind their peers. We are creating gaps that may not be able to be closed for those students. Uh, the mental health and well-being of our students is first and foremost, and I feel that is suffering most at this time. Uh, the second quarter when we seconds. were in person was the highest student engagement I've ever had in my 20 year, over 20 years of teaching. Kids want to be in school. They are so excited to be there, and they are participating even in math class. Um, <laughs> I can say that third quarter, when I was online recently, a student said, why try? They, they simply cannot maintain this remote learning. Time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Ella Choi is next, and Amanda Bowser is on deck. Ella. Madam President and members of the board, I'm Ella Choi, and I'm sophomore class president at Castile High, and I strongly believe we should be back in person. As a student, I have witnessed and experienced the hardships that these students are having with virtual learning. I also created Speak Up Stand Up, which is mental health and suicide awareness, and we have seen these numbers skyrocket with virtual learning. It's very important for us to be back in school and be able to make those connections with our peers and for them to be able to ask questions and reach out for help. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ella. Next is Amanda Bowser, and on deck is Maren Voto. I'm here to ask you to vote to return our students to in-person learning on January 19th. Education as an industry is not the only industry in Arizona that has risk. It is safe to say that every industry in Arizona that has been open and operating during COVID-19 with mitigation strategies has some level of inherent risk. The rhetoric of not until it's safe is a fallacy as nothing is 100% safe. Pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID. The state of Arizona is, for the most part, open with mitigation strategies in place. Education should be no different. Of course, we have to take measures to protect our teachers, our students, and their families. CUSD has mitigation strategies. CUSD has been modifying and improving those strategies as necessary. Schools are not the source of community spread. 15 seconds. Our state is open and operating. Education must, too. I want to state clearly and emphatically that in-person education is essential. Please don't let this turn into another two weeks, then four weeks, then a quarter, then seven months of no in-person instruction. The fallout is Time something that expired. will take countless years for our students and CUSD Thank to you. recover from. 
Marin Vota is next, and then um, Lindsay Burnett is on deck. Hi, my name is Marin Vota, and I'm 12 years old and in the sixth grade at CTA Independence. Shout out to all my hawks and my wonderful teachers that are working so hard. My parents told me if I wanted to speak that I needed to come up with my own thoughts and words, so I'll do my best. It is my understanding that you're meeting tonight to discuss allowing in-person learning for those of us that want to return to class. I want to tell you that I hope to, you do allow us to return in person. This year has been really hard for me. I have always had really good grades and loved being in school and learned very well. This past year, I have had lots of, I have lost that, some of that desire and my grades are not great while learning at home. I have gotten very frustrated and angry at times. I have been upset and cried many times. I have also seen my teachers work really hard to do the best they can, but it's just not the same. I'm not able to learn or grow as well remotely as I can when I'm being taught in person. This is true for me and many other as well. I find that I have way too much free time during remote learning, which causes me to be distracted and not focused. 15 seconds. I see my older brother struggle a lot more than me even. He doesn't even leave his room for days at a time. He fights anxiety and depression all the time. It's really sad. I just wanted to say that I hope you vote to allow us choose which option would be best for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lindsay Barnett is next, and then we have Gabriella Brooks on deck. Hi, good evening. I'm Lindsay Barnett, and I am a CSU do, CSD <laughs> parent of three boys, seven, five, and three. I'm here tonight to plead with the board members to give us the choice to learn in person or online. This is not a one-size-fits-all situation. This is a time where every single student deserves a quality education, and we've all seen that virtual learning can deeply be deeply problematic for many kids. There is so much scientific evidence that has emerged and continues to emerge indicating that keeping kids at home is more detrimental than them being in person. If a teacher, student, and family collectively decide that, that in-person is better suited for their situation, they should be given that option. Why is it all or nothing? If we are masked up and socially distanced, why are we taking in-person options away from students and teachers that thrive in that setting? Why is it okay to go to Costco and Target while masked up and socially distanced, but not okay to attend school in person with proper safety protocols to enrich our children's minds? Dr. Fauci, seconds. Dr. Fauci has gone on record stating that we should try as best to keep our, our schools open and that the spread among children is, very, is not very big at all. Even our own governor was quoted saying that the state would not be spending money on empty seats in an effort to implore schools to get back to in-person learning. I urge you and the board to make decisions Time. based on expert opinions, facts, and scientific evidence. Thank you. Thank you. So Gabriella Brooks is on deck, and it looks like this might be her mom, Blaine Brooks, uh, uh, Blaine Brooks, our father, sorry, Blaine Brooks um, is with her. Thank you for letting me speak today. My name is Gabriella Brooks. I am in third grade at Fulton Elementary School and I have the best teacher ever. My experience of online learning due to COVID is that trying to learn online is really hard. I am in all advanced classes and I know I am really smart. So I know it's not that I am just not trying or because I'm not smart. It's really hard to communicate with my teachers ask questions, pay attention, and learn lessons. I know there are a lot of little hearts out there that would really like to see their friends and teachers. We have been good about wearing masks and distancing. We promise we will keep following the rules. Please let us go back. Thank you, Gabriella. Uh, Blaine Brooks is next, and Ruth Jones is on deck. All right. Uh, thank you, Governing Board, for allowing me to speak. I'm the father of two students in the Chandler Unified School District. You just met one of them there. With regard to voting on in-person learning decisions should be based on facts. The majority opinion of the community served and the recommendations of our county's health experts. The CDC came out today to say that schools should reopen when they can do so safely. This was the result of an analysis showing that COVID-19 incidents among younger children are consistently lower. Dr. Fauci echoed this sentiment in December, quote, if you look at data, the spread among children 
and from children is not very big at all, not like one would have suspe suspected, so let's try to get the kids back, end quote. Pediatricians and board members of hospitals across the state and country echo these sentiments. There's a plethora of scientific research showing the effectiveness of face coverings and social distancing. The CUSD dashboards seconds. further evidence that scientific studies with numbers that were consistently below threshold, the fact that Arizona's lowest case numbers were since June occurred when kids were in school, again, evidence supporting this science. The science is clear, the experts are clear, schools, when Time following safety protocols are not the problem, kids Thank are not you, the Mr. problem. Brooks. Thank you. Uh, Ruth Jones is next, and Sarah Fresh Freshette is on deck. At the last meeting of this board, I was dismayed and troubled by what I heard. As you discussed the future of education for our children, you didn't make them the priority. I heard no science, no numbers, and no evidence at all. Board member Modson at least brought up the needs of students and noted that the state is currently open, but you still wanted to close the schools. I found it troubling that that thought was countered by board member Love, who brought the discussion directly and quickly back to the teachers. I do not want to forget teachers, but there is no science to back up that concern. In fact, the science suggests that transmission from student to teacher is unlikely. I feel we need to focus on our students. Many of them do not function well with the online options. We have students with disabilities, both physical and educational, that need walls to learn. We have seconds. students with mental health issues. How many of our children will become collateral damage because of your fear? I know the cost of COVID. Last week I buried my father-in-law, a good man. And I stand here to tell you that if he was alive today, he would tell you that the first priority is our children. And until you make it your first priority, we will not succeed and Time they will expired. not succeed. I ask you Thank to you, please Mrs. think of our children. Thank you, Mrs. Jones. And I, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones. Oh, I'm sorry. I want to express my sympathy in the loss of your father-in-law. Thank you, I appreciate that. But I'd rather you express sympathy and concern for my children. Thank you. Sarah Frechette um, is at the microphone and Amy Eloy is on deck. I'm thankful the board has been so open about its fear regarding a dip in enrollment if they follow county guidelines and remain virtual. I understand if there's no enrollment, there's no money and teachers like me are out of a job. But I invite CUSD to remember its worth. We all know CUSD is the premier district of choice. Parents might get angry about remaining virtual. I know they're threatening to pull their kids and some might even do it temporarily, but they'll be back. CUSD has it all. CUSD has Arizona's finest. Those are Camille's words. CUSD has the best academics, the best sports programs. The parents who want the very best for their children will come back to this district. If you believe what you're selling as a brand and as a board, that CUSD is Arizona's premier district of choice. If you believe in the quality that we seconds. teachers, coaches, support staff, administration provide the children of the East Valley, then I invite you to lay down your enrollment fears. Take care of this community and the community will take care of you. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Eloy and on deck is Linda Feria. It's actually Amy E.B. I'm and sorry. That's okay. I decided to withdraw my daughter from US, uh, CUSD when the board was dragging their feet with recommendations for in-person versus virtual learning. Frankly, you lost my trust. I knew my honor student needed a high caliber learning environment this year and Chandler Online Academy did not fit the bill. I have been a pediatric medical provider for 23 years. I am aware of the AAP stance of in-person learning. The AAP made the statement when the rate of transmission was much lower than it is currently. The statement was not made because they believe that transmission is not occurring within the school walls. You and I both know this has been occurring all year with in-person learning. We can all agree we want our children in school learning when it is safe to do so. Many of my patients tell me they are not eating and drinking while they are at school. This further complicates learning. In order to eat and drink, seconds. they must remove their masks. There is nowhere on campus this can be done safely. I am begging you to see your teachers as the precious resource they are 
Without quality teachers, you do not have students. Without students, expired. you do not have funding. Thank you, When Amy. you stand up and protect your teachers, your you protect your students, their families, and our community. Thank you. Linda Faria is um, at the microphone, and Christine Diaz is on deck. I am a teacher, married to a teacher, and mother to three daughters that attend three different schools in this district. I have a choice. Unfortunately, they're not everyone has a choice when it comes to a quality online education. And right now, there is no room at COA. This leaves no virtual choice. COA is not the best learning environment when it comes to AP students. We have many at Hamilton. One of the top AP students this week that came from COA told me, I am so glad to be critically thinking once again with my peers. This directly credits the dedication of our staff at Hamilton High School. There isn't a choice for teachers either. When I signed up in person, I believed the mes metrics that the board said they would follow, and now three are red, and they put me in danger daily. Teachers are no longer have access to the COVID relief uh, paid seconds. leave fund. It is imperative that we keep safe. Much of this disease is still unknown. My own teenage nephew, who scored a perfect score on the SAT, spent a week in the CCU with an enlarged heart and is no longer eligible for the military. Do not think this won't happen to our own students Time here. Time has expired. At Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Christine Diaz. Um, I'm sorry, I think I, uh, could you state your name? It's Christine Diaz. Okay, okay. I, I kind of got some papers messed up. And uh, Diane Lundahl uh, is on deck. Thank you. Christine. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Christine Diaz, and I'm a mother of an amazing senior at Chandler High, and I also have the privilege of working at Willis Junior High with seventh and eighth grader students, and these kids are great. I'm here to share my experience as a teacher and request that we follow the metrics and remain virtual until vaccinations are in full effect and the metrics show that it is safe to be in person. Last quarter, Willis was hit hard while metrics were only in yellow. On any given day, upwards of 50 students were quarantined. I personally had three students who were quarantined two and three times. A September 2020 study by Princeton found that the largest COVID-19 contact tracing study to date found children to be the key spreaders of coronavirus. This was something at Willis that was experienced by students, by teachers with classes, seconds. up to 40 students in there. Our health assistant and front office staff were hit with COVID despite all of the mitigation efforts. I agree kids need to be in person, but that in-person experience needs to be consistent, free of anxiety and fear, along with not Time adding burden to the local hospitals. Thank, Thank you. you, Christine. Diane Lundell is at the microphone and um, Kat McIntosh is on deck. Good evening. I'm here tonight um, just to clarify a quote. In a report featured November 30th on ABC News Daily podcast, Dr. Fauci clarified his quote about kids being safer in school. And now I quote him. We get asked it all the time. Close the bars and keep the schools open is what we really say. Obviously, if you don't have a one size fits all, but as I said in the past, the default position should be to try as best as possible within reason to keep the children in school. If you mitigate the things that you know are causing spread in a very, very profound way, in a robust way, if you bring that down, then you will indirectly and ultimately protect the children in the school because the community level is determined by how things go across the board. Fauci added, you and I all know that his recommendation did not apply to a hot zone 15 where our governor will not close down bars, gyms, and restaurants. If the district insists on putting teachers and students back in the classroom under the current metrics, please do not use Dr. Fauci's or Dr. Fauci as a voice to ease your conscience. Time has expired. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, Kat McIntosh is at the microphone and Frank um, Pezzarello is on deck. Am I good? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I address you today as a parent of two CUSD students, a 20-year veteran of education, and a former CUSD teacher, as well as a concerned member of our community. In brief, I urge you to immediately reconsider your stance on virtual instruction and acknowledge your clear bias for in-person instruction for all. 
I'm disgusted by the return to person presentation as it communicates that the district's intent uh, to, to return to in-person learning regardless of any discussion here tonight or the thousands of comments made by the community opposing it. This district continues to ignore safety metrics and insists on using your own unsubstantiated claims and cherry pick sources. These are not data-based decisions made in the best interest of safety. They are budget-based for decisions forged in fear. Our schools do serve a diverse population and there are some valid concerns on both sides of the divide. This should never have been a winner-take-all debate. I ask that you consider the various needs of your population and propose a graduated alternative compromise seconds. that caters to the highest needs and those who volunteer while allowing for a viable option to those who need to stay home. Please make some effort to protect the educational rights of those who wish to remain physically safe in your care. No one would argue that on December 14th, 2020, Sandy Hook Elementary was the safest place to Time be. Time has elapsed. That's the same Thank absence you. of logic being Thank applied. Thank you, Kat. I appreciate your comments. Uh, Frank Pezzarella is uh, at the microphone and Katie Nash is on deck. I received this today from the Athena Foundation. Data puts CUSD at 973 per 100,000 people for the week ending 112. The test reports uh, during that period are primarily from 17 and earlier, meaning the current data has yet to show the impact of virtual learning. If CUSD would wait at least a week, they are confident that the case rates will drop. We are nearing 1%. Neighboring QCUSD is approaching 2,000 for 100,000 people. Waiting at least one week will validate the continuation of virtual learning. So where does that put us? CUSD has continued to say teachers are valued, we are doing a great job, and we are not being uh, attacked punitively. And that's true until the next day when it isn't. So as the governor runs around in his emperor's new clothes, do we continue to tell him we're incompetent and stupid, or do we do something about it? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Katie Nash is at the microphone and Chris Chen, or Chu, I can't tell, um, is on deck. First, we thank you again for hearing our concerns. We appreciate the switch to virtual learning. We recognize it was not an easy decision. We are once again advocating for us to remain in virtual learning until the community spread is substantially reduced. Area hospitals are nearly at capacity. Morgue trucks are being used. We are continuing to set records with positive cases and deaths. Numerous staff members are not even able to attend funeral services for loved ones who have passed away from COVID. Simply put, staff are afraid. The Maricopa County Department of Public Health states that the COVID level spread in the community is an important factor in determining when it is safe to carry out in-person instruction. The experiences of other countries have indicated that operating schools may be, may be low risk in communities with low spread rates. As you make this critical decision tonight, seconds. I ask that you listen to the countless staff and parents who have shared heartbreaking stories of loss. Until Governor Ducey takes more drastic measures to protect our community, our students are safest at home. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris is at the microphone and Elizabeth Manji is um, on deck. It is Chris Chu, sorry. Chris okay. Chu, it is, thank yes. <laughs> Madam President, members of the board, thank you for letting me speak tonight. My name is Chris Chu and I'm a teacher at Hamilton High School. When I leave here tonight, I will go home to a house built for four people, but holding seven. Two of those people have celiac disease, which is an autoimmune deficiency issue. They cannot fight off illness like people who are healthy. I risk their health every day. They'll multiply their potential exposure exponentially when I have classes full of kids each day during this pandemic. My family did not sign up for this. None of us did. It does not have to be this way. As much as we all want the kids back in, it is not worth dying over. They are learning just not in a typical way. Learning to adapt to situations presented to them is as valuable as any lesson is. I would say this to our governor, but in typical fashion, he passed the decision on to you. We are all counting on you to do the right thing. 15 seconds. Keep classes virtual until it is safe for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Liz Elizabeth Manji is um, at the microphone and Kurt Roars is on deck. Elizabeth? Hi, thank you, uh, Madam President and members of the board. I don't have a speech written out like everybody else. This was a last minute stop. 
Um, I have two children in the C CUSD. I have one that is in honors classes, but when this pandemic and all the school closure came, he just gave up. All A's, now he's struggling with F's, C's at best. I know your teachers are scared to death. Some of them are not, but this isn't all about teachers. When you had last, the last meeting and you had teachers threatening to do a sick in, that's bullying. And that's giving the students no say. Maybe you should talk to the students more like seconds. the little girls. This, this is about kids. And then you send out a, an email saying that suicide has grown. There is a correlation between non-socialization and the suicide. You guys really need to think about that for the students' sake, not just the Time teachers. Has elapsed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kurt Roars is at the microphone, and Mark Manji is on deck. Madam Superintendent, staff, and board members, my name is Kurt Roars. I'm a parent in this district. The board needs to decide if their priority is truly education of children or manage the employment of adults. They somehow seem to now become a simply a labor relations board, giving only lip service to the community's needs. Virtual learning is inadequate for educating our children. Effective teaching has been limited, standards have been lowered, and student performance should naturally follow this deteriorating trend. In the past, this community has been very supportive of additional funding for this district in the forms of bonds and overrides, which has delivered quality education to our children. But the current situation is not what we paid for. Parents and taxpayers are now getting an inferior product foisted on them by the unwillingness or inability of the board to keep up their end of the bargain. seconds. So when is the board going to rise above the power politics games being played by political activists and recommit to providing quality education for our children? When is the board going to reject the hyperbolic, self-serving rhetoric put forth by political activists and finally put students and the community Time first elapsed. in their policy decisions? Thank you. Thank you. Mark Manji is um, at the microphone, and Charlotte Goya, or Gola, I'm not sure which one, um, is on deck. Mark is not here. So we move to Charlotte. Charlotte Hello. Just a moment, Charlotte, just a moment. I'm going to, um, Jackson Monroe is on deck. Okay. No, 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 no. You're up, but Jackson is on deck. On deck. That makes more sense. <laughs> uh, hello. My name is Charlotte Gala. I'm a parent to three children in district. A child in grades K through three needs near constant guidance during the virtual school day. Without it, the child will not learn. From kindergarten through third grade, children learn to read. From fourth grade on, children read to learn. Numerous studies clearly demonstrate the vital importance of reading by third grade. I've emailed one such study by the Annie E. Casey Foundation to the board for your review. It is mainly our low income children that do not have a caregiver home to guide them through the virtual school day. On site care, while important to keep our children fed and safe while their parents are working, does not replicate what a caregiver can give during the virtual school experience. 15 seconds. As a result, virtual school through grades K through three is completely inequitable. It's time for Chandler to remember our commitment to equity in education and send grades K through three back to the classroom. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jackson Monroe is um, at the microphone and Libby Jones is on deck. Hello everyone, my name is Jackson Monroe and I'm the student body president at Payne Junior High School. I am very supportive of going back to school in person and I'd like to show you why my school is safe enough to open. My teachers always follow the CDC guidelines. My student council advisor, Mr. Deont Tremont and language arts teacher, Ms. Plum, always make sure we use hand sanitizer before entering the room. 
My social studies teacher, Mr. Cussie, and my science teacher, Mr. Ionson, are vigilant at disinfecting our desks. My AP teacher, Ms. Lockhart, is always careful that we keep our masks above our noses. My math teacher, Ms. Montoya, and orchestra teacher, Ms. Dopp, are experts at keeping us socially distanced during classes. The chief janitor at our school, Jesus, is a cleaning machine. You should see him at lunch. He is probably the best janitor I have ever seen. He is quick, consistent, and awesome. Payne is probably the most cleanest and most sanitary place on the planet because of him and our seconds. awesome staff and teachers. I, would, I love my teachers, and I would never advocate something that would put their life in danger. We work together in unity to keep each other safe. Thank you for voting to open our schools, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Jackson. Libby Jones is at the microphone, and Saya Anavakar is um, on deck. Tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> my name is Libby Jones. I'm the parent of three elementary school kids in, within CUSD. I believe, as members of our community, we have a responsibility towards each other. I also believe government plays an important role within our community to support us through as we navigate through crises. This is an important opportunity for local government to show they are competent, nimble, and taking into account the needs of the community members. As a family member of five frontline healthcare professionals, I have seen firsthand how proper Im implementation of personal protective equipment is effective in curbing the spread of the coronavirus and the resulting disease. Additionally, there are multiple studies done by reputable institutions that show the transmission in, el in elementary schools is exceptionally low. These two facts combine together to make the decision to close elementary schools illogical. I believe it is vital to our primary school children's development that they participate in in-person learning. I also believe we can do this safely. In this case, science and learning seconds. are not at odds. Please carefully consider your role in caring for our community members during this time of crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Saya or Sia is at the microphone, and correct me with your name in a moment, but on deck is Stephanie Tokars. Could you pronounce your name for yeah, me? It's Sia Anavkar. Sia, okay, okay, thank you. Sorry I butchered it. <laughs> it's okay. okay. Good, e good evening. I'm Sia and I'm a freshman at Hamilton High School. I chose COA at the beginning of the school year, but self-learning is really hard for a lot of students, myself included. So I, along with many of my friends, decided to switch to in-person learning. We believe that CUSD needs to provide us with an equitable virtual option. Many of my friends and I believe that this past week of virtual instruction has been amazing, and my teachers are doing a great job of making sure that all students are learning just as much virtually as we were in person. I miss life as it used to be, but the truth is we aren't back to normal yet. With Arizona's numbers on the rise, there is a lot of anxiety in the classroom about being exposed to the virus and potentially putting our loved ones at risk. Last summer, my family was personally affected by the pandemic when I lost my grandmother to COVID. It's really hard to say goodbye to someone over FaceTime. If by being virtual for another two weeks means that we can prevent more people seconds. from having to go through the same thing, then I think it'll be worth it. Today's numbers aren't better than they were last week, so it just doesn't make sense to go back to in-person yet. Please consider extending virtual learning so that we aren't forced to put ourselves and our families at risk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie Tokars is at the microphone, and Austin Upchurch is on deck. Good evening. Children always come first. Everyone in here is ultimately here for the children. Despite the best efforts of teachers and parents, the children of this district are suffering emotionally. They are struggling mentally. They are not being challenged academically as they would be if they were in a classroom. It is unfair to offer such an inconsistent and poor substitute for the superior education we have come to expect from CUSD. In the last year, our elementary kids have missed 82 school days. You can no longer blame the pandemic for the gap in our children's education. This is on you. The governing board. You closed our schools on a whim. CUSD had an innovative dashboard and plan to mitigate the dangers while giving our children the quality education they deserve. You discarded those seconds. statistics 
for your personal opinions. You force students, families, and teachers to completely alter their lives 11 hours prior to the start of the school day. COVID is here to stay. There will be lulls and there will be spikes. We need to be able to adapt with it. Time has elapsed. Thank you. Thank you. Austin Upchurch um, is at the microphone and Ryan Heap is on deck. Hi, my name is Austin Upchurch. I am a fourth grade student at Tarwater Elementary. I believe virtual learning is worse than in person. The, uh, here are, so, are just a few reasons that I believe virtual is worse than in person. One, it is difficult to sit at a computer all day. Two, it is difficult to concentrate in a live meet. We stay in a live meet when we are working on our schoolwork so we can ask our teacher questions. However, every time someone asks a question, it interrupts every student who is working and concentrating. Three, it also makes me tired. I am used to being up and ready, and instead I am sitting and staring at a screen all day. Four, parents tell you not to be on the computer all day, so when you, are, so when you have a break in class, you read. Then you aren't, when you aren't looking at the clock, you accidentally miss an important meet. Also, we are safe at school, we wear our masks all day, we use hand sanitizer lots of times, and we, and we socially distance at lunch. We follow the rules because we want to stay in school. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ryan Heap is at uh, the microphone, and Brianne Hamilton is on deck. Oops. All right. Thank you for your time. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Camille Castile for your service in the, our district. It's been fantastic having you here. Um, it's kind of unfair going after a kid. I'm not going to get applauded, but it's all right. I just have some questions for the board. Um, are the teachers and staff who feel unsafe teaching in person, are they doing their part, refraining from going out to eat, shopping, traveling? abstaining from gathering with friends and extended family. Can the district reasonably provide a quality education to single parent families, families with both parents working? How will this board address the growing budget deficit as families, students who are promised a choice to be taught in person are continually denied that choice? I just asked the board this evening that you need to seconds. choose who you want to serve and move forward with your choice. If in-person instruction isn't a choice, I will move my family of four kids to a district who meets my needs. Thank you. Thank you. Brianne Hamilton is at the microphone and Beth Wamsley or Wamsley is um, on deck. Am I good to go? Yes, Brianne. Okay. Um, I had something that was two minutes, so I'm going to try to cut it down. I'm a former teacher in Chandler Unified and a mother of two boys. Um, I'm here and I have an email from a teacher who currently works in Chandler, but was um, too intimidated to come because they're afraid to be ostracized at campus because they believe they need to return in campus. Um, I just kind of wanted to read a little bit of it since I don't have much time, but anyways, um, she says, when it comes to Google Meets in the last week, I've had maybe five students sign on for assistance, five out of hundreds. Most of these students have become accustomed to sleeping in, choosing laziness and apathy as their main daily chore, gaming, or if we are lucky, working a job. When I call parents to speak to them about this, I have to remember that these people are working and I am bothering them during their work days, which translates to them not wanting to speak to me, let alone address the elephant in the room, which is that their child is slipping away, heading the opposite way seconds. of learning. If I do hear from parents, it's to tell me that their daughter has spiraled down a deep hole of depression and the root cause is this online virtual learning. I think I asked the board that you remember who, that you work, not work, but you know, the community wants you to do what's best for our children and we believe that it is in person. Time so thank elapsed. you. Thank you. And our last, the last blue slip that I have is uh, Beth Wamsley or Wamsley. Hi, I'm a mother of five children in the Chandler District at four schools. Um, I was really hesitant to come. I'm a very private person, but you need to understand how this is affecting our students. I have a student at Basha High School who is a CAT student, um, 
4.0 plus grade point average. He gets up every morning. He's not that kid she was talking about. He works hard after school. He was literally failing a class the first quarter, literally failing a math class for the first time ever. We didn't know what was going on. And he goes in person for the second quarter. He has to relearn all of first quarter plus second quarter. He takes his cumulative test at the end of that semester, and he gets a B. He was learning two quarters work at once. He was not failing. His school failed him. The, the virtual learning was failing my kid. I have another kid that's a kindergartner, and I'm sitting with him every day, and I'm positive, Miss Bruner. I had sticker charts and dance parties. I was doing everything, and every day was a fight. I was sitting with him for six hours a day. You need to understand that you are failing students by having the virtual seconds. learning. I have five students, and I will take them out. If we're not, if we're not in, in school on Monday, at least that kindergartner's coming out. And I've always been an advocate for public education. I've always felt like there are more opportunities in the public education than elsewhere. But you're taking those opportunities. And if I leave, we're not Time coming back. You have completely broken our trust. Thank you. That concludes our citizen comments for this evening. Um, uh, so thank you very much for, to everyone who has come out. I don't know how many of you are still left in the building, but. Um, thank you. I appreciate hearing all of your comments, and uh, we appreciate you coming and sharing them with us. Next is our consent agenda. It's very short today. So, Dr. Castile. Madam President, members of the board, your consent agenda is very short today. We have donations, items that were donated in the amount of $210, and human resources and set employment, separation, and compensation. We recommend approval of the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Dr. Castile. Uh, could I please get a motion to approve our consent agenda? Moved. Madam President, I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. All those in favor of approving our consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. We now have our, to our action items, and our first one is the follow-up to the January 4th, 2021 board meeting regarding virtual instruction, um, January 5th through the 15th of 2021. Madam Dr. President. Oh, wait, Dr. 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 Uh, Madam President, members of the board, on, um, at our last meeting, I think the administration um, succeeded in confusing our constituents and probably the board. We had presented two various uh, different options. One was virtual and one was in person. Hindsight is always 2020, and we should have probably read those aloud so that the community knew what you folks were looking at and, and could have at least known the options that were in front of you. For that, I apologize. It doesn't change the fact that the vote would have probably been the same, but I know there was confusion in the community as to what you folks were looking at. At this time, the administration is coming forth with a recommendation based on the January 4th meeting when you approved a two-week quarantine that was at the request of many staff and, and community members, scheduled to end on Friday the 15th with the three-day holiday it was returning to instruction on the the 19th, I believe. All C we're recommending all CUSD students pre-kindergarten through 12th grade return to campus on Tuesday, Jan January 19th, 2020, after the Martin Luther King holiday to resume in-person instruction. At this time, we have asked a couple of our uh, team members here to present what was a accumulation or a culmination of several hours of work on behalf of the cabinet and the directors that have been intimately involved in this discussion. It is unanimous uh, recommendation um, if there's any question out there. And we asked to put upon Mr. Sleeter. I think many of you know him. He's former principal. He's the director of elementary education. He was the Carlson principal. And uh, Mrs. Amber Stewart, she is the, I know you're familiar with her. You've had her present to you. She's the director of research assessment and about everything, everything else we can get her to do. And they have put together the PowerPoint. If you would, we have put in front of you uh, the PowerPoint in half pages large enough so that you can make notes on it. What we'd like to do is have them go through the whole, in, whole um, program 
And with you making notes, and after you um, get a motion on the floor, certainly ask them questions, actually ask questions, and we have Dr. Gilbert, Mr. Narducci, Mr. Rother, Dr. Nance, uh, that can assist in responding to all the questions, and hopefully that this will give us an opportunity to paint the full story, the full rationale to the board and the community, ask questions, and then certainly the decision is ultimately, as everybody knows, it rests with the school board. So I will turn it over. I believe Mr. Schleter is going to start. Is that correct? Yes. So thank you. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board. Again, my name is Leo Schleter, Director of Elementary Education. And I'm here with Amber Stewart, our Director of Research and Assessment. And we want to thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. This presentation, in support with our district administration, will reaffirm the intent to return to in-person learning on January 19th with the acknowledgement and understanding that school choice remains a core value in this district. Safety practices and protocols at all our campuses are in place and working. The implementation of Chandler Online and Elementary Connect remain a viable option for those who are looking for a virtual option. And multiple data points and information continue to be considered to inform our decision making. I'm going to have Amber come and present the first part of this presentation. Thank you. Before we begin with our objectives tonight, we first want to take the time to thank our families um, for their flexibility in the decision last Monday. Regardless of how we feel about virtual or in person, that decision landed heavily on our families in finding childcare, making arrangements for students for virtual learning, and having those conversations about that change with students. We appreciate them and we're grateful to be a continued partner in their child's education. We also want to rec recognize our CUSD staff. Great efforts were made for that quick transition into virtual learning. It started with our quick communication to families, our CUSD staff gathering resources to quickly transition, and our teachers taking their lessons and putting them on an online platform to get ready for the next day. While a lot happened on January 5th, we did want to highlight some of the features that it took to transition us into that virtual learning environment. While it wasn't a perfect process, we know that at the end of the day, on January 5th, over 10,000 devices were in the hands of students. We were able to provide 652 Wi-Fi hotspots, which is internet connection for our families. And both of these numbers continue to grow throughout the course of the week as we worked to connect with our families to make sure that students were logging on and accessing their learning. On the first day of virtual instruction, January 6th, our help desk answered 2,842 calls. But we know we didn't reach the masses and that we weren't able to support everyone in that day one of learning because we had over 10,000 calls made to our help desk on that very first day. Moving into our objectives, tonight we'd like to review the COVID-19 timeline for CUSD. A lot's occurred in the last 10 months and we'd like to review that. We're going to look at the data and processes used to inform decision making. We're going to review the school learning models, specifically in person and virtual, because that's been a lot of our conversation over the course of 10 months, and reaffirm the plan to reopen on January 19th for all of our students in person. Moving to our first objective, we're going to review the timeline. The first step of this began in March when we transitioned our teachers and students to virtual learning. A majority of our students and teachers experienced virtual learning for the very first time in March and had that for the duration of quarter four. Under the governor's executive orders, we had to remain in virtual until August 17th. CUSD wanted to get the learning process started for our families, so we opened schools virtually on August 5th. In preparation for the executive orders being removed after August 17th, the Maricopa County established benchmarks to support schools in determining when to reopen. 
On August 17th, the governor allowed schools to reopen. However, CSD remained virtual through September 14th. At that time, we began phasing our students back to in-person learning. There was an important update in October on the Maricopa County webpage. And that update, after evidence was, or after data was gathered, because schools had began to open, Maricopa states that other measure, measures can be used when making the decision of determining what learning model should occur for the campus. They asked us to monitor school by school active cases. In response to that update on the Maricopa County webpage, CUSD brought a presentation to the board on November 18th. That presentation provided um, information about the CUSD dashboard in response to what our healthcare providers um, asked us to do in monitoring those school by school active case rates, which is what our dashboard does. In addition to that, uh, creating thresholds to determine when our schools should close or when each school should be able to close um, during that time based on the active cases on the campus and the enrollment. On December 9th, it was determined that we would allow, that we would allow families at the secondary level to have a two-week virtual option for families that wanted to quarantine after winter break. On January 4th, there was a special board meeting to determine that we would transition all of our students back to online learning pre-K through 12 which is where we currently are. Our students are in online learning. With the recommendation that we return in-person choice on January 19th. Leo is going to discuss our next objective regarding all of the data that's being looked at. Thank you. Once again, um, objective two. We're gonna share with you the five critical pieces of data that we continue to use to inform our decision-making as we return to in-person learning on January 19th. We recognize there's a host of critical factors that must be considered. The five major factors that we are taking into account and continue to take into account in our decision-making are of course the Maricopa County benchmark data, the CUSD COVID-19 dashboard data and the, and the school-specific thresholds that Amber just spoke of, the student considerations and needs that we take into account, the safety concerns and the mitigation plans. And I wanna make a point, the word mitigation is going to be used throughout this presentation. What we're really speaking about are those safety practices and safety protocols that are used on a daily basis. But again, the mitigation plans that are put in place to address those concerns. And then of course, what the experts are telling us, those CDC, state, and county health official recommendations. We start with the county benchmarks. They are but one critical factor that we regularly monitor. However, as Amber said, it's important to understand that while the county benchmarks were originally established in early August, absent of any other school data. In October of 2020, they provided additional guidelines to local school districts for consideration when looking at reopening schools. You can see on this slide that while it states that all three benchmarks should be in red for consideration of virtual learning, this statement itself is a general recommendation. And in discussion with the Arizona Department of Health, they've agreed to support local jurisdictions who are able to maintain a safe learning environment with regular school by school monitoring, regardless of the levels of community COVID-19 transmission. So as a result, we continue to review all the information as it's updated that's presented to us by our county health officials. And I would direct your guidance to the very top of your, sh of your slide. That link does take you to this, um, to the dashboard where these statements can be found as well as all other updated information released from Maricopa County Health. So in, so in response to the County Health's guidance to take other factors into consideration, CUSD went ahead and created its own dashboard to monitor active cases on each campus. The dashboard's updated regularly as data is released. It displays the confirmed active cases the percentage of active cases, 
and a, and a cumulative number of the resolved cases at each campus. And then as you look at the bottom chart, additionally on January 4th, the CUSD board approved revised thresholds for temporary school closures. This too was done in response to looking at further data and ensuring that a net yet another level of mitigation was implemented to address the higher community spread that, that is occurring. And while we understand that there's been some question as to the accuracy of the dashboard data, I think it's important to point out the following. Positive test results are reported to us through both self-reporting as well as county reporting. While typically we may hear from parents and staff first, our dashboard does indeed represent all the cases reported to us through the county. In response to the concern about the reporting of data for those students and staff who didn't experience their infectious period while on campus, CUSD once again updated their dashboard. And as you scroll down further, you'll find a chart that gives you, that tracks all of those, um, those cases that have occurred from students and staff while they, were, while they experienced their non or while they experienced their infection, their infectious period not being on campus. And finally, as another mitigation factor, our district continues to enforce strict protocol, far stricter than prior to the pandemic, of sending home any students or staff that display any one of the typical symptoms that have been identified. So once again, I want to reiterate that in alignment with the county and state guidelines, we, consider, we continue to consider all school metrics as we gather updated data and we plan for the return to in-person on the 19th. The third factor we look at is, of course, our student considerations. They include instruction, social-emotional, special education, the student meals, and child care. When we talk about instruction, we're talking about technology access, student engagement, the opportunity for immediate feedback and intervention, the assessment priorities and mandates from ADE and the federal government. And I would ask if you have questions about that, Amber at a later point can speak in greater detail as to the impact of those assessment mandates, as well as the high yield teaching strategies that we know are best delivered in person. With respect to social emotional, we speak of the safe environments that are created for kids at school and their ability to have positive peer interactions, connect with needed staff like counselors, social workers, and engage in interactions with peers and staff in a predictable, and structured setting. We know this pandemic has led our students and families to greater isolation and feelings of depression and other mental health challenges. So we certainly take those into consideration as well. Special education considerations take into account the 5,000 plus special education students we serve daily and the free and appropriate public education that is both vital and federally mandated for students with special needs. We look at the compliance requirements that accompany all of our students' individual action plans and the peer and staff support that's critical to the student's success, particularly for those who have learning difficulties. And yet another student consideration are the student meals and our opportunity to provide frequent and consistent meal service to all our students. It's important to note that typically, CUSD serves 150,000 meals weekly Throughout this pandemic, when we're not in session, the typical service rate has been approximately 75,000 meals weekly. So we know our ability to effectively reach all our students is being affected. Finally, we take a look at the child care considerations. And we take into account the need for our families to have a safe and secure setting for their children to be both before, during, and after school. Additionally, we consider that pressure that's put on our families to identify and afford childcare that will not only be most appropriate, but also offer an optimal learning environment that enables them to engage in the required virtual learning. It's important to note here that prior to the pandemic, we served approximately 3,500 students a day. Throughout this pandemic, when we were in session, we typically averaged 1,200 per day. Currently in the virtual setting, we're at about 150 students per day. So we know that childcare and our capacity to serve our families with appropriate childcare opportunities are affected. The fourth critical factor we, take, we consider is safety concerns 
and once again the mitigation plans that we have in place to address those concerns. This slide gives a little snapshot of some of the things we have, uh, many of the things we have in place at our campus. Certainly it's not exhaustive. We've hired additional certified staff to help and support. We've installed plexiglass in key areas in all our buildings. We have sufficient inventory of masks and gloves for students and staff. And I think it's important to note that that's not just through the purchase by the district, but also the many local agencies that have stepped up to plate to donate thousands of gloves and masks for our district. We've implemented traffic patterns and pieces of signage throughout all our campuses to ensure, to try and minimize the contact of, tra of students who are traveling throughout our campus. We've, uh, we've installed hand sanitizer stations in all our classrooms and throughout our campuses. We purchased disinfectant sprayers for our sites, which allow them to easily disinfect, uh, actually quickly disinfect outside equipment, playground equipment, providing for a quicker return to use between, um, between sessions or between use. Of course, we've equipped all our classrooms with additional cleaning supplies, and we continue to work with all our sites to ensure that those cleaning supplies are updated and provided for anyone who needs them. We've fogged all of our secondary schools over the break, over the winter intercession, and we continue to fog our transportation vehicles throughout use. And then, of course, we've extended the custodial hours at our campuses as necessary to ensure that we can keep a safe, uh, a safe and well-mitigated environment. In addition to what was mentioned on the previous slide, we've of course established this two-week virtual period from the 6th through the 18th um, to help us mitigate the return from winter intercession. We continue to contact trace and implement our, our quarantine protocols in alignment with the current county health guidelines. We partner with our local agencies to increase access and ability to receive COVID-19 testing, much like our partnership with ASU and the saliva test that takes place at Chandler High on the weekends. We coordinate with the Maricopa Department of Health, Maricopa Department of Health and other local agencies to provide access to vaccinations. They were rolled out January 11th, and while I don't have any firm data, Anecdotal data in my talks with fellow colleagues would tell you that many are in line to get their vaccines starting this week. We continue to cohort students. I know the word cohorting is kind of an education jargon. Really what we're speaking about is grouping students to keep them safe and to try and minimize contact on the campuses throughout the day. And while we know that that's not a perfect science, what I can tell you is one of the factors in our cohorting is that we are able to keep students and staff on, in an environment that's mitigated five days a week, six to eight hours a day, depending upon whether you're, pre depending upon whether you're participating in before or after school sports or childcare. Of course, we continue to restrict parent and visitor access to our schools, outside field trips, and try to minimize any large gatherings that could occur. We require that adherence to the social distancing and the physical distancing throughout the school year, where and when feasible. And of course, we continue to implement staff and community feedback for continuous improvement by engaging with all our stakeholders to make sure that we identify what we can continue to do to keep them safe. And I know that uh, the committee that met, I believe, earlier last week um, with representatives from each of our schools, mm -hmm. I do know that Dr. Gilbert and Mr. Narducci are working on um, plans as follow-up meetings with that committee as well. So the final critical factor that plays an integral role in the consideration of what the expert is, is the consideration of what the experts tell us and the guidance that's provided by our local, state, and federal health professionals. For the brevity of this presentation, the slide bullets on this slide have been hyperlinked to their respective quotes and articles for you to view at your discretion. As well, we've put some additional resources in the notes section in your, in your PowerPoint um, that you can access as well. And I think what's most important to note on this page is that these recommendations are by no means advocating that schools must be closed or schools must be opened today. What they do instead advocate is that and reinforce is the importance of considering multiple data pieces when making decisions about school opening and school closures. 
I'm now going to turn this over to Amber to finish the remainder of this presentation. Our next objective is to look at the learning models, specifically virtual and in-person, because that's been part of our conversations for the last 10 months. While both of these lists can be very long, these are the pieces that are consistently brought up from feedback in the field or in conversations with cabinet. So in looking at the opportunities that are provided in virtual, we know that we have limited school exposure. We can't say that we have zero school exposure because we do have students actively on our campus during that time. We know that virtual can provide flexibility to our families in terms of time and location their students are engaged in learning. We've had uh, the ability to provide professional development to our teachers with educational technology that we may not have gotten to prior to this pandemic at such a, in such a short amount of time. And with that, we've had a greater opportunity to introduce digital resources to staff and students. However, when we're all virtual, we lack parent choice. We know that we have a digital divide in our community, which was evident in the number of technology that was needed to be distributed on January 5th. Teachers struggle with the lack of student engagement and accountability consistently in having their students engaged every single day um, within their coursework. The pressure for childcare has landed on our families during the time that they would typically be in school. As a district, we're, struggle, we're struggling to track attendance of our students and get them connected to our district. As the Arizona Department of Education has said, 50,000 students are not engaged or connected to a school, and we know some of those students are Chandler students. Just last week, we had 2,000 students we were unable to connect with when we transitioned to virtual. There's a lack of immediate feedback for intervention and differentiation at the discovery point of learning. Teachers and students have to be connected at the same time in order for that to happen right away. We've shifted the responsibility on family to monitor learning daily, and we know that social interaction with peers can be limited. In looking at our opportunities within person, we can incre increase social interaction with peers in a structured and predictable environment. We have the opportunity to provide hands-on learning for our students with increased engagement because they are coming to campus each day. We avoid the technology divide because all of the resources are available in our classrooms. Our teachers have the opportunity to provide consistent and immediate feedback um, to support our students in their learning. That allows the opportunity to provide intervention and differentiation that our students need. As Leo spoke to earlier, we do have a greater access in providing more meals to our families when they come to campus. And we have the opportunity to, pro to provide that child care time during the school day. And we know that our staff and students are in a mitigated environment for six hours a day. However, when we're in person, we know there's a potential for exposure for our staff and students to COVID-19. We know that our students are missing instruction due to district quarantine protocols under the Maricopa County Health Guidelines. We've depleted our health office resources. We have difficulty with social distancing at the secondary level. And there is staff and student anxiety about being in person. However, there's been a lot of conversation about if this could really live in both sides of being a concern in either model. Because while we know there are staff and student anxiety that, that's occurring because we're in person, we're hearing from the field about teachers being anxious about being in that virtual environment and students having um, anxiety through that, especially during a time when anxiety is high to begin with. And finally, in our last objective, we'd like to reaffirm the intent to return to in-person for all of our students on January 19th. It's the district's recommendation to return to in-person on January 19th with the following factors in place. We're going to continue to strengthen the mitigation plan and mask enforcement. Monitor all data measures. This includes county and local benchmarks looking at our school thresholds and monitoring active cases at each campus, 
continuing to look at student cons considerations and needs, and following our health experts with the CDC, state, and county. In closing, school choice is a core value of the district, and it keeps our district viable. And by providing in person, we provide an additional choice. Mitigation efforts are effective for staff and students with continuous improvement. And Chandler Online remains a viable option for online learning. Well, we appreciated this opportunity to present. At this time, Cabinet would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Dr. Castile, did you have any final comments? No, that would be our recommendation um, as provided in your board packet, Madam President. So I don't know if you want to do questions or get a motion on the floor in order to ask the questions. I'll leave that to you. I think we'll go ahead and um, ask for a motion first. Um, Madam President, I move that our schools open in for in-person learning on Tuesday, January 19th, 2021. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and start asking questions. Um, our whole cabinet uh, looks like is here. And um, are there any questions for? Um, I, I have a question, actually. Um, <clears throat> if we don't have a motion at all, our school schools open up back open back up the day after. <laughs> if we don't have a motion at all, our schools open back up on the Tuesday after Martin Luther King holiday, right? Um, that was your, that yes. was the original, but that was the original one. And you asked to have it brought back to you. Okay. So. And I do have a question. Um, uh, a few people have written me emails and a couple of people remarked tonight that there was a waiting list for Chandler online. Um, what's the, what's the story about the story behind having a waiting list, but for Chandler Online Academy. We had I, 70, we had 74 people, I believe, in online. We've authorized, uh, or I've authorized the additional staff to be employed, and I believe they've all received emails or communication so that their children will be enrolled by Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken. I'm looking at Dr. Gilbert. I probably shouldn't have cut in Dr. Gilbert, but we have, um, we're adding additional staff in, in order to make it happen. Um, Mr. Olive. I'd like to add that the, the, the reason for the waiting list is because at the end of the first semester, when we had the intent to return, we had a number of students, actually over 800 um, at the secondary level that moved from online back to the home school, okay. which then our HR department worked with all of our sites to move teachers from the online back to their sites. So we had to have staffing settled so that we knew what we had. At that same time, we approved 74 open enrollments from the building back to the online. So that was occurring before we went on break. So the majority of the open enrollments that asked to move to the online took place over the break while we we're having schools come back in and establish where staff was going to be. We had a wait list and we let families know that there's a wait list while we're getting staff settled so that we can have staff moved into and increased at the online in order to address those needs, which we started moving students. Um, everyone that was on the wait list has been reached out to and established that their, uh, their movement was approved and they've been working with COA. Okay, thank you. Can I add one more thing? Um, Elementary Connected at Chandler Online. Katie Moe there has done a nice job. Our, our office sees all the open enrollments and the requests to move back and forth. And uh, there were, probably two or three times a week we would get together to talk about that transition. And she had been working with moving all those students as the requests came in and did a really good job. Again, the programs are a little different, a little more synchronous learning in the elementary program because we, we need to do that to keep our kids connected. Uh, but she was clearing those lists as they came in. If somebody was on a waiting list, it was because it might have been specialized services that we had to see whether the online environment was best for that student to learn in or whether we would need to service them a little bit uh, more in the in-person setting. Okay. A follow-up question uh, while we're still um, on COA. Um, we were having individuals uh, move at the quarter 
um, are at the end of this, this particular semester one. And are there still opportunities for individuals to move into COA prior to us going back in person on the 19th? Yes. We've been moving students today, and we've had some new um, open enrollments that came in today that we've already moved forward on. So, so the process, Ms. Mazin, is they just fill the open enrollment out that they want to be in Chandler Online. What they do need to do is for Elementary Connect, they need to contact COA uh, Katie Moe over there. She will give them the link specifically for this year's open enrollment because we have posted on our website the current next year's open enrollments. They'll get that link and then she will work directly with them uh, to tell them when they can start. And what happens when we do have um, someone who is a special ed student um, who is asking who might have um, um, a disability who would like to go on to um, uh, COA? Any student that um, has a disability or is on an IEP, we work directly with Dr. Marshall's office to determine what their needs are and to be placed um, in the online or making sure that their needs can be met in the online. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Miss um, Love? Yeah, I have a question or a few. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. So I think like looking at the timeline and where we started in March and now to today, um, and I thank you for the time that went into the presentation, but I think there's just kind of a disappointment in terms of from March to today, it's the same presentation of the pros and cons of in-person versus virtual learning. And yes, we have people who want in-person and, and we've heard that today, but we also have community members that want a virtual option for a number of reasons. And I feel like we're not getting a viable um, virtual option that works for our families, especially if we're talking about choice, you know, COA is not a viable choice for all of our families. And we do have families who switched from COA to virtual when we did that back in whatever month we did that in um, and decided to be virtual because they needed that consistent one-on-one -on -one virtual worked for them. Um, and then we, we flipped courses and now their option is either being on campus or being in COA, which we know that COA doesn't provide all the AP honors classes that families need. Um, we know that it, you know, we have SPED families who are disappointed with the options between, you know, COA and, and in person. So I would have liked to have seen a virtual option, even though, you know, we've talked about all the pros and cons, the community has been asking for it and, and I still don't know what that looks like. And I, I feel that we've had almost a year to work through some of those barriers. Like these inequities with our families, our, our less affluent families, our families who are struggling with um, the social emotional pieces, um, our BIPOC students, SPED, um, you know, all of our families who fall, or our students who fall within those opportunity gaps have existed. They've been magnified by COVID, but they have been in existence. And I was just hoping that after a year, and we, we kind of had a head start because we do have an equity program. I was hoping after a year, we would have something to offer families aside from these two options. Well, I'd like to say one thing in regards to the virtual option that has been a conversation since um, the pandemic started. And that really has to do with some of the conversation is, can you have a virtual option where a teacher is, have, is in the classroom with students in person and at the same time teaching them in the virtual. And that's been most of the conversation of the difficulty and, and the feasibility of doing that and having, a, a, having instruction um, being done well and at the same time teachers being able to manage that all at the same time. And since the beginning, that is something that we have not, we have not done. And because of the feasibility and the difficulty of teachers being able to do that, so when we look at what are the other virtual or some possible options of virtual so that parents can have that option and it's not the online, then you have to figure out how you could have staff 
and manage students being in a virtual option at the same time where they're not having to teach in person and an in-person teacher being able to teach the in-person and not address the virtual option. The, the staffing that that would take to try even manage that with, let's just say, for example, in the secondary, the master schedule at a high school is difficult at best when you're just managing setting up your schedule. So to try and set up a schedule where you have teachers teaching in person and the other group trying to manage, let's just say math, algebra one, geometry, algebra two, pre-calculus, diff EQ, calc BC, the number of courses that you would just try to manage what's gonna be in person and what's gonna be virtual, that in itself becomes very difficult. Is it impossible? I'm not sure if it's impossible, but to manage that to even try is, is difficult at best. And then you still have all your electives and we haven't got into the other cores. So that's part of the difficulty that you have when you look at what does virtual mean? The mm -hmm. online, I agree. And we know that the online isn't established for everyone. One of the things we tried to do right in the beginning is to add the classes that we didn't have. Is it a perfect science? Is it a perfect situation? No, and our situation that we're in is, is not perfect. We still have over 4,200 students that are in the online. 1,500 of those are, are, are in part-time. So I understand uh, your, your frustration or your need of wanting to look at something other in regards to virtual, um, but it does become difficult to figure out what does that look like and how do you manage it from a structural mm -hmm. Um, situation. So I do understand your, your frustration. But let me push back. And I know, uh, Mr. Narducci, you, you want to jump in too. Because the concern from what we've heard has been on the secondary level in terms of not being able to social distance. Um, you know, students or, you know, teachers not wearing their mask adequately. Um, those are, these are all the emails that we've gotten. Um, you know, that anxiety um, that was mentioned with students and teachers and being in the classroom because they're unable to engage in some of those mitigation factors. So, you know, while I understand, I know that, you know, Mr. Narducci is going to come in and talk about why that's not possible on the primary piece. I would hope that on the secondary piece, we could try something, especially since from time to time, we have families who are out quarantine, right? And their biggest gripe is that they're missing instruction. They're just given packets um, and, and that's not enough. So I would hope that we would have something a little bit more innovative. And we have some very talented professionals in this district. Um, we've got some you know, teachers who are probably, if you, you snapped your fingers, they'd be willing to you know, write some curriculums and come up with some solutions for a virtual program. But I hope in the secondary, like we have an option that is valid for families because the secondary is where we struggle the most with some of these mitigation factors. And secondary should likely not be open in a lot of cases. Well, I can, I can agree with the struggle of mitigation. And we've talked about being able to social distance at the secondary since the beginning of when this has started, which is why our push is to make sure that we have mitigation practices, whether it's washing hands, whether it's masks. Our, our students perfect in wearing masks, our staff know, and that's why we're continuing to push, making sure that you are wearing masks because masks is one of the uh, keys to making sure that we are protecting each other. Uh, there was a study in November of this last year by the Mayo Clinic in regards to masks that when you have both wearing the mask, the percentage is a 0.5% you know, 0.5% of, of protecting each other. So that's one of the reasons why we made the major push to make sure that these are some of the mitigation um, pieces that we have. We've been having discussions on what are options that we can do. If when we look at the address of how can we reduce a class size or reduce the numbers in a class, you really have two options. If you're going to reduce the number in a class, you either add teachers, which we already don't have space to put more teachers if we were to add more teachers or you reduce the amount of time a student spends with a the teacher. Then you have to address the issue of how much content can you cover in that short period of time. But again, it's, it's, not, a perfect, it's not a perfect science and it's something to, to continue to look at. But I think like everybody wants to go back to kind of like the Fauci quote in terms of the mitigation strategies and keeping kids in school. But we're already, you know, part of that was, you know, he did recommend not opening in a hot spot, which hello, Arizona is a hot spot right now. 
um, and following those mitigation strategies. So if secondary is unable to do that, why is the recommendation to keep secondary open? Well, I, with all of that. Well, I, I, I would um, respectfully disagree. We have been working and having mitigation strategies since the beginning. We have been pushing for the same mitigation strategies of washing hands. The issue of not having, um, so being able to social distance has been something that has been discussed since the beginning. It hasn't been a, something that's been hidden in the conversation. Oh, no, I'm not saying that you're hiding it. I, no, I'm no, but I mean, just from the perspective of focusing about, on what uh, those mitigation yeah. strategies are. Well, yeah, I, you've always been very honest about secondary being a struggle, and I do appreciate that. But my concern is, you know, okay, we can wash hands, but we're not social distance. Like kids are packed like sardines in the hallways. Um, we're getting emails from families saying, and, and children saying, you know, people aren't wearing masks, like, you know, as much as, you know, you would think. Like they're walking around with masks below their nose. We saw it with some of our, you know, speakers tonight, where their masks were below their nose as they were talking to us. Um, so, you know, I don't know, like, and I know that you're doing your best, and I know that everybody is doing their best to make sure that secondary follows those mitigation strategies. But from the stories from our teachers, our staff, and our students and families, it's not happening. So I can't confidently vote for this, especially as far as secondary, because those mitigation strategies are not being followed. Do we have any other questions from other board members? If not, then we will go ahead and go for a vote on this. I have some comments. I thought you asked for questions. I didn't have any questions. Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, so I just wanted to make a few uh, comments. Um, so the, the slide that you have on page 15 regarding the, res the uh, uh, sources for your recommendations, I believe you meant to put American Academy of Pediatrics there. And that um, document, I just wanted to mention a few things that they have in that document um, from January 5th, 2021. Um, first, a uh, quote from them, some countries have been able to successfully reopen schools after first controlling community-wide spread. Um, so that's a quote from that. Also, current data in the community as well as evidence from transmission in schools needs to be used. So um, we can't just disregard the community data that's in the dashboard um, for the county. Community-wide approaches to mitigation are needed for schools to open and remain open. Children 10 and over may spread COVID as efficiently as adults, and this should be part of the considerations. And students two and older should wear cloth face coverings and, and the emphasis is on their, in their, uh, it's italicized in their um, document, and should also physically distance, and they refer to that as six feet in another part of the paragraph. So um, I feel like even the documents that you used in your presentation we're not following, you know, we're taking pieces of it and we're not looking at the comprehensive thing that they have said. Um, there are elements that we have been ignoring. And so I have an issue with that, even in, you know, what you have here on top of some of the other studies uh, like Bronner and uh, Goldhaber and some others that look at MPIs, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, and, uh, you know, do factor analysis that try to get as much of the confounding variables out of there as they can. No research is going to be perfect. But at least we can say the research is mixed on about whether schools are um, centers for spread in the community. Um, there, there are some on both sides. And it's very difficult, as I said the last time, when we look at correlational studies, we have to try to figure out how to eliminate out all those confounds, right? And there are multiple studies that show that. Um, and a new document just came out last week about that. Um, uh, I'm keeping it pretty short tonight, but um, I also just want to ask or mention um, to, that we don't have the coverage for teachers like we did before um, the end of last year. So last year we had uh, sick leave coverage 
and now we don't. And so um, I think that's an issue, especially for first year teachers who don't have enough sick days built up and then they're running in the red with their sick days. And, we're, and they may have gotten sick at school and then um, they're basically having to um, use their own sick days for that uh, when, when it sometimes can be traced back to the school. It's not always. Um, we need to look at um, safety task forces at the sites, especially ones where we've gotten a lot of complaints and, and that hasn't happened yet. Um, when a family member is positive, all the data shows you should be staying home. Um, we're not doing that. In fact, even when we know teachers are exposed, they're coming in. Um, and um, I don't think with the um, quarantine data that we have from the chart, it didn't change the length of the time. So I think that was part of the original proposal and what was approved the last time was a lowering of the criteria from, um, so I believe it's 7.5 times what the county states is um, significant or substantial spread up to um, 15 times, right? We, we changed that, so that's actually lower than what we had before, um, but we didn't change the time. It's still five days, right? So that's something else to consider in, in what, when we approve this, that that's um, part of that. And I think I'm done. Thanks, Kay. If there's no other questions or comments, um, we will go ahead and vote. Um, all those in favor of opening um, schools on uh, January 19th for in-person instruction, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. No. Um, Mrs. Nye, it was um, Mr. Worth, myself, and Mr. Olive, who voted yes, and uh, Ms. Love and Ms. Bruner, who voted no. Thank you very much for your presentation this evening. Um, we appreciate it, and um, I know you put a lot of work into it and a lot of time, um, and we, we truly appreciate uh, you coming this evening and speaking with us and talking with us about all the different things that are going on. So thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you. Our next um, item is um, going to be presented by Mrs. Berry, our school district annual expenditure budget revision number two. Madam President, members of the board, tonight we are revising the annual budget expenditure for 2021 for the second time. You approved the original proposed budget back in June. You adopted the budget in July. On December 9th, you um, approved a budget where we had to reduce our budget by approximately $14 million due to the loss of ADM. And at that meeting, we discussed um, that I would be coming back to you in January to reduce the budget again once it was finalized with the Arizona Department of Education, the distance learning portion for an additional $12 million, which you will be doing tonight. I'm going to cover four quick things on this sheet. It's um, a four-page document. I just want to review four things to update the new uh, board members and to review with the old uh, existing board members um, what we did approve on December 9th and with the reduction of $14 million. I'm going to cover tonight the revision that you're actually approving and voting on in this action item for the reduction of $12 million, an additional $12 million, which makes a total of 20 point. $25.9 million. And then I'm going to talk about the COVID funding just on the relationship to how much that has meant to CUSD so far um, up to this point. And then the last thing I want to do is just hit on um, where our ADM currently is because as you know, we're starting to um, get ready and prepared for next fiscal year. And as we go into um, the process of a budget committee, our meet and confer, which we call Super Q, um, and we develop everything for you to approve this spring and then adopt in June. It just gets you to start understanding where we're at as you hear um, all the pieces of information as they come to you over the next few months. So to begin, 
Um, we are able to revise our budgets up until May, um, but with the reduction that the Arizona Department of Education gave to us on December 16th, we could not include that in the first revision, and so we're doing that with you tonight. On December 19th, we reduced the budget by approximately $13.8 million, and that was due to the ADM loss of approximately 1,800 students. Um, we had not predicted that loss, as you all know. Uh, we use applied economics um, to do our um, demography from outside. And so this has been a huge hit, not only to our school district, but to other school districts across the state. Right now, I think they have stated in, in webinars we've been on, there's about 50,000 students that are not somehow accounted for right now. Um, so we're not unique in this form, but for Chandler, um, right now we have lost uh, approximately uh, ADM-wise, 1,800. So just to explain the difference between enrollment and average daily membership, which is what we call ADM, we had 46,926 students who were sitting in a seat at the end of last year. Um, we, right before the break, um, which we, um, on December the 9th, we had, we showed you that we had 44,559 students, so it was a decrease of 2,367 students. That doesn't equate to average daily membership because students are counted from day one through day 100 as an ADM. So if a child comes on day 50, leaves on day 100, we only get 50% funding for that child. A kindergarten student only counts as half. There's a number of things that impact that. So we lost approximately 1,800 students in total, and that's what made up that uh, reduction that you approved for four, approximately $14 million. Tonight, the revision that you have in front of you, that's the Excel document that you're actually approving and signing and we upload to the State Department, will have an additional $12 million reduction on that for our maintenance and operations fund. So we have, capital is actually based on last year, so that didn't get impacted. But ultimately, maintenance and operations and the ADM, that, that students that are coming to your schools, the, the ADM loss, again, which impacts maintenance and operations, was reduced by $12 million. We presented on the 9th that we would be impacted by about $11.7 million was our estimate, and the actual amount was $12,026,000. So you can see you adopted the revision with a reduction of 13.8, and now we have an additional 12 million, and that equals $25.9 million. So to explain that reduction, it's based on distance learning. So how do we get to that calculation? And that's the, the information I wanna share. I tried to put a few more explanations in um, above. So a student who comes to brick and mortar is funded at 100% when a child comes to our district. And that's set by ARS statute and our legislature. An online student is funded at 95%. Without our legislature reconvening, the only way we could fund a distance learner, which is a learner that's in a virtual environment, but not necessarily in an online environment, the governor gave an executive order stating that a distance learner could be funded up to 95%. So we operate in that fashion. Ultimately, the governor had a directive that said we could not start in-person learning until August 17th. So no matter what, we had a distance learning situation from August 5th through August 17th that no matter what, we were gonna take a hit for, for that percentage of time because we are not in person. From August 17th to present, that's a local decision that gets made based on distance learning. So from the 17th on, that's our local decision. CUSD, our first 40 days, um, we were virtual 91% of the time, and we were in person 8.6% of the time. So this calculation for the reduction of $12 million was based on the first 40 days. We could see a revision back with less of a hit to that, and we're actually going to ask and, and hope that our legislators eventually um, could maybe remove this or change this. But at this point, it, we have been reduced by $12 million because for the first 40 days, we were virtual 91% of the time. So how does that work? Well, like I showed before, here's Jane. And she was, if, you, if we started school on August 5th in person and stayed there all the way through January 26, we would get 100% funding for her. However, currently, we're not going to get 100% funding for her because she gets reduced because she was a distance learner. And for the first 40 days, every child in our system gets calculated by the percentage we turned in for our district, which was 91.4%. So when you take 5% times 91.4, 
you get 4.57%. So you subtract that from 100%, this child, every child in our district gets in sense funded at 95.43%. So that's what equates to the $12 million. Anyways, that's the, the reduction that you're taking today. Um, that came out on December the 16th, and so we were revising our budgets to match um, the uh, what's called the APOR, which is a, result, uh, a report created by the Arizona Department of Education reflecting our current funding. So tonight, that is your revision. I want to emphasize what does that mean to Chandler so that we understand, however, there is federal funding that came in to help support uh, this deficit. We had four different funding pots that we have discussed with you um, that came from stimulus package number one. The first was what we call ESSER, which is the Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief Fund. And that was to help with mitigation strategies and expenses. And it came out in the spring and it was to cover for about 18 months to help us with the expenses to get our schools going or to help with virtual learning, mitigation plans. And our board decided to spend, utilize those funds to help get teacher computers and, and student computers out um, to them during that first quarter where we were all virtual in the spring. The governor's, the second one was the governor's emergency relief fund. And we have not been able to access these funds. Most of these funds are, are earmarked specifically to uh, specialty programs like the Arizona Deaf and Blind, there was vehicles, there's other things that are specific. Rural Arizona uh, was able to access some of this for bro broadband. There's different things that were underneath this. We have not accessed any money in this area. The third one was the Coronavirus Relief Fund it's the Enrollment Stability Grant to all of us, and what we're used to hearing is ESG for Enrollment Stability Grant. And that's because districts, like you know, were declining. And so the governor had um, stated and utilized the funds that came in from the stimulus package to stabilize our districts because obviously if ADM goes down, we don't have the funds that we thought we were to um, to pay for our budgets and the expenditures within our budgets. And so for us, there was $370 million allocated. We, we received 14 million. Should have received a little bit more than that, and I'll explain that in a minute, but we should received 14 million. We also received a small amount for number four, which is the DEMA money, Department of Emergency and Military Affairs. We've received about 63,000. We're hoping to receive a few hundred thousand dollars more. We've spent a lot more than that, but that's on personal protective equipment, um, plexiglass, mitigation, signage, communication, all those things. But unfortunately, we have not been approved for very much, and, and not very many districts have. At one point, only a couple months ago, the Arizona Department of Health was the only one who had received reimbursements on that. We're starting to see districts now receive um, a, a small amount, and hopefully we'll receive more in that area. So what does that mean to us? So the first area is ADM revenue loss, because that's the biggest chunk of money that we're losing. As you know, from the past two, um, the revision you're doing tonight, plus the revision we did in December, we lost $25.9 million in ADM and distance learning impact to ADM. So with the governor's original um, request to fund schools at 98% of their ADM last year, we thought we would receive approximately $20 million. But unfortunately, the need across the state was more than this $370 million that was allocated. We heard that it was close to $600 million. So unfortunately, they could not fund school districts at the amount that they originally thought they were going to be able to. So we thought we'd only take out a hit in the revenue side by about $6 million. But unfortunately, as you can see, we've reduced our budgets for the ADM and the distance learning portion for the ADM by $25.9 million, and we received $14 million to stabilize for the enrollment piece, which is a reduction of $11.6 million. So our ADM overall between those two funds is down $11.6 million. We know that our needs outweigh the federal and state assistance. And, and another time, I'm going to bring back in a study session all the expenditures that um, we have taken on related to um, COVID-19. But the one area of federal funding that we have received is we received $3 million. 
to help us towards those mitigation strategies. And I know I've shared before in the last presentation that we've had over $18.5 million worth of um, expenditures to help us with those mitigation strategies, including hiring approximately an extra 100 staff members to help us. We've done professional development and we've had an additional amount of technology that we've had um, to support our students and our staff. So when you take the revenue of $3 million from, the, um, from ESSER and you apply it to the $18.5 million we've had to spend, we have, in a sense, we have spent $15.3 million of our own money to make sure that these mitigation strategies um, are in place for our school district. So I'll go through those expenses later on, but ultimately tonight what you are doing is you're revising an additional reduction of $12 million. But we will come back to that at a different point in a study session and through the budget process for next year. The last thing that I want to make sure to cover is just the reduction of ADM and this year. As you know, we're in current year funding, um, even though we're trying to stabilize it as much as we can with the federal stimulus money. But CUSD has seen a decrease um, in our early childhood uh, preschool, our K through six, our seven through eight, and our, we have seen an increase in our ninth through 12th. We thought we were gonna grow and all of our predictions for high school and junior high, we've seen a decrease in our junior high and a, a slight growth in our high school. We knew we were gonna decline in elementary, but not at the rate that we have. We thought overall we were supposed to grow 300 students this year, and instead we are down 2,384. So that impact is huge because we start to predict staffing ratios for next year. Um, we have to look at our programs that meet our journey 2025. And unfortunately, majority of our budgets are 90% are for are related to salaries and benefits. So that uh, is definitely gonna, gonna hit our, um, our school district and our community next year. What does just the reduction of ADM mean to us right now? It means approximately 186 staff members. So ADM does matter in the form of without that, um, we can't fund certain programs and staffing at the levels that we currently have. The other thing I think that uh, we heard in the presentation earlier is that the, this number was before the break. Right now, without kids, if they're not connecting um, at Chandler Online or connecting in person, there's a chance within 10 days that you have to drop a child. If they're not, if they don't connect within 10 days and haven't been present, then we have to withdraw them after 10 days. So we'll be bringing back to the board where our ADM is, um, and we should be able to tell you that within the next uh, couple board meetings. And that's all I have for this presentation. Thank you, Mrs. Berry. You're welcome. Um, could I please get a motion to um, accept the um, or uh, to adopt the 2020 the 2020 2021 district annual expenditure budget revision number two. Madam President, I make a motion to adopt the 2020 2021 district annual expenditure budget revision number two. Is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, Mrs. Berry, um, let's see if, do we have any questions from board members? Ms. Love. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Berry. I know that we met um, yesterday before I broke my finger <laughs> um, to go over this. Um, and we had a good discussion yesterday and I wanted to just kind of like ask you some of the same questions that I asked you just to kind of be transparent. But what is, what's the impact to the federal funding piece with a new administration coming in? Sure, so there was a stimulus package that was approved at the very end, actually, of the current administration. And so that piece should be coming through. Okay. Um, and we have learned some information. It will be funded like ESSER. Mm -hmm. So it'll actually get administered underneath the new administration. And it will be funded like the $3 million was funded um, related to title. It, our allocation for ESSER was based on our Title I allocation. They say that that will be four times the amount. So we should receive approximately 12 to $13 million. Now, there's a lot that'll be changing. With the new administration, there might be additional funds that come forward, or they might be maximizing the current amount. Um, I do think that the new administration is public uh, education friendly. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully we will see some of those changes. But right now, for example, testing is still on, and that impacts some of our funding that we have for this future year. Unless that changes with the new administration, 
testing impacts a lot of our results-based funding. It, it also um, impacts some of our other federal funding. Now, one thing I want to say is that the federal government doesn't have a lot, and we, you and I talked about mm -hmm. this. They don't have a ton of money or influence in our state overall budget related to the number of kids that come to school and the transportation piece. But they do have a say in our entitlements, and they do have a say in our special education. And I know that's a worry. If we can't serve our special education needs uh, for our students, that, that we could be in jeopardy of losing some of those funds or be challenged by some parents on those pieces. So we want to make sure we maximize that. But I definitely think that moving forward, um, we are going to maximize every dollar that we can um, from the federal, from the state organizations, and hopefully people understand uh, we're trying our best and we're doing our best, and um, they can help stabilize and help us uh, continue our growth for our students. Yeah. Thank you. And then the second question I have is, you gave us a really cute picture of Jane mm -hmm. funded at, um, what was it, 94%? Yes. Um, but you also told us that, you know, it could lead to um, cuts, which would be, well, I believe it was 186 staff. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to students? Because that's also teachers and staff. So, it, you know, that's pretty broad in terms of, like, who could be let go in terms of like a riff, right? Yes, like absolutely. what does that mean to programs like, you know, social work and, and counseling programs and, you know, our, our kids directly and our teachers directly and some sure. of the programs that we offer that make Chandler so great? Sure. Great question. And I know we've got to talk <coughs> just a second about that too. So this distance learning portion hopefully will be gone next year. And so we did not equate for a reduction of 20, almost $6 million. We only took a reduction, what we're planning for, hoping for in the future, is just the ADM loss, which is almost $14 million. So this is impacting us this fiscal year. We're hoping, if we're all back in person next year, that we won't have this $12 million that we're dealing with. And we're only dealing with the $14 million of reduction of the 1,800 students, ADM-wise, that we've lost. But you are correct. When we scroll down to the bottom and we've lost those students, we know that 90% of our maintenance and operations funds are salaries and benefits. So what does that mean? It's equivalent to 186 staff members' salaries and benefits. And that could be, we have a broad range. We have, we have certified staff, we have classified staff, and we have administration staff. We have programs that we run that are obviously equipped with individuals who run those programs. So we're going to have to analyze all of that this spring um, when we go through the budget process. Of, we obviously are going to look at class sizes and reduce based on the uh, threshold of that. But we're also going to have to look at programs that we have in place and then how can we get to $13.8 million. Or .8 million. Um, hopefully some of the kindergarten students um, will return that we lost approximately around 400 students in kindergarten compared to last year who did not come to school. Um, hopefully some of those students will return. However, we do know that we have lost students to charter schools, to private schools, to homeschooling, and then we know we have not connected with a number of kids who are not in one of those entities. And unfortunately, what we have seen is when we do lose some of those kids, it's very difficult for us to get them back. We will try. We're going to try very hard to, um, to market and to tell how great we are at Chandler Unified. But we are worried about getting those students back. Thank you. I, I do want to say, like, um, Chandler does have a pretty robust program, especially in terms of, like, the social emotional wellness piece. Mm -hmm. And from what I've heard from, you know, families who have chosen charter or, you know, private school, um, you know, social emotional piece might not be as robust as ours. And then there's also that SPED piece. So, you know, mm -hmm. we are the district of choice kind of due to that. Um, but people unenrolling at the rates that they are do really strip us from offering the services that we offer to the community at large, which I think is important mm -hmm. to discuss. If we really do value mental health, then we keep kids in public schools. If we really do value our SPED program, we keep, we keep kids in public schools because we serve everybody. So thank you for making those distinctions. Absolutely. Do we have any other questions or comments on the budget um, for Mrs. Berry? I'll just make um, one comment. Um, it does, it certainly worries me um, looking at, at next year. Um, 
that there are definitely, you know, I'm, our budget problem would be solved if we get the kids back. Um, it won't be solved if we don't. Um, just kind of making it very, very simple. Um, and I think that we do have community members that have been very, very frustrated with, um, with the district um, over the lot during this COVID crisis. And I, I do hope that uh, they, will, they will come back and bring their kids back to our schools. Um, but if they don't, we, we definitely have some um, very difficult decisions ahead of us uh, looking at the, the 2022 um, budget for next year. And it certainly um, has me a, a bit concerned. So that's just kind of my, one of my comments. Madam um, President. Yes. Um, when, you, when you see those numbers, it makes me think about how supportive our community has been relating to passing overrides and bonds. And thank goodness they were there. And it helps reduce um, the impact on our budget. The other thing, Dr. Castile and I don't, I don't think we've ever experienced having to let off 186 staff members. I guess the good news is there is a teacher shortage, so hopefully those individuals will find a job. Yes. Great points. <clears throat> thank you. Um, if we are done with questions and comments, uh, we'll go ahead and, and vote on the budget revision number two. All of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. I believe now we move on to our information items. And let me pull my... We have, first we have our second quarter technology report. Mr. Fletcher. Madam President, members of the board, the second quarter technology report is there for your information. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions or comments from the board? I do appreciate the additional um, information that is out there. Um, and I, I do see negative numbers, so I assume that's just the stock that is being removed from the warehouse. And then um, sometimes there's, it's returned because it possibly wasn't needed or whatever. Okay, so. Next, we'll go to our student activity auxiliary operations and tax credit reports. Mrs. Berry. Madam President, members of the board, the student activities, auxiliary operations, and tax credit reports for the months ending July of 2020 through December of 2020 are provided for your review. Are there any questions or comments? Mrs. Berry, I have a question, a couple of questions. Um, when I'm looking at the auxiliary report, um, there is a school that has a very significant over the $10,000 um, as a negative balance. It's for the International Baccalaureate Program. Um, was That looks like there was some kind of a major accounting glitch or something. So what happened there? Yes, so we will be making a journal entry on that after the um, during this uh, month of January. So we ultimately pay for it for the different fund, but it all got charged to the okay. account. Great. And then I guess the other question is, as we look through the student activity and the auxiliary um, accounts and the tax credit accounts, um, I do realize that tax credit can be uh, given to the schools all the way until April 15th. Um, how, what is the health of these, all three of these funds, would you say? We are very fortunate um, in Chandler, so that's a great question. Um, we, our usage in these funds has been down, and the revenue coming in and the actual usage of student activities, auxiliary, and tax credit. Um, because there hasn't been any field trips, the activities are, are not at the level because of no travel, no play, some of those pieces, not, not no play, but I'm, uh, the activities that are extra or additional outside of um, the, require, the allowable ones through AIA and other activities. We're fortunate because our families contribute to tax credit and they um, are a lot of our student activity funds, our students and their families are engaged compared to other school districts across the state. And I think we have the largest amount of tax credit contributed than any public school district in Arizona. 
So we had a good balance coming in um, to this fiscal year that will help. So for example, in the elementary schools, they will be able to offset their, um, their field trip costs this year because they weren't able to access some of those fees um, and things last year. We also allowed sixth grade money to be moved into seventh grade in tax credit so that our seventh grade could ultimately provide some services or field trips for free. I know in our elementaries, um, Mr. Narducci has been working to bring in virtual field trips and options for our kids to give them opportunities. So we're still trying to find ways to utilize and make use of this. We changed the statute so that our schools could utilize tax credit dollars to buy um, technology items and other things. So our schools have been utilizing those uh, to buy more technology devices or to improve things on their campuses. So we are trying to use that. Um, but there is a big change compared to where we were at when we were um, before COVID, just in the sense of we are not, don't have near as much activity as we did in the past. Great. Are there any other questions? No? Okay. Um, next is our private day tuition expenditures for quarter two of the 2020-2021 school year. Mr. Rother. Yes, uh, Madam President, members of the governing board, uh, the list of private day school tuition expenditures for the 2020 20 21 school year are provided for your review. Does the board have any questions? I'm going to be another one to ask another question. Sure. <laughs> um, when I look at the remaining amount um, on the report, um, it appears as though we are a, li a, a bit under, or, well, we still have the remaining amount of well over half um can you talk to us or um kind of give the rationale as to um is it because the school closures earlier in the year what why are we seeing the differences of the, on this compared to last year so so compared to quarter two last year we're down our expenditures are down about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars uh, and we saw that in the first quarter as well. Uh, one of the reasons for that is uh, parents utilizing the empowerment grants or the ESAs. Um, and then uh, the other reason for that could is that our uh, teachers are, are doing a good job of keeping students placed in Chandler schools in addition to the growth of the CLC program. And so that's where some of those students, instead of being placed in private day, are in our CLC program so they wouldn't show up on this report. So our expenditures are down when it comes to private day expenditures from where they were last year. Thank you. I think the next item is yours, also Quaver Music Curriculum. Yes. Um, Madam President, members of the Governing Board, uh, the last CUSD Music Curriculum adoption was in 2004. On October 27th, 2020, the Curriculum Department submitted an RFI for elementary K through six general music. The curriculum department has identified Quaver Music to present to the governing board for use at all K-6 campuses beginning in the 2021-2022 school year. Quaver Music develops online curriculum with a focus on general music education that combines engaging digital resources and ongoing professional development. The online curriculum resources include customizable lesson plans, lesson plan presenters, a teacher gradebook, auto-graded assessments, class play, box brain, World Music, Unlimited Students Accounts, Access to Online Resources and PD, Quaver Unplugged Content, Virtual Training Programs, uh, Quarterly and Quarterly Content Updates. The cost for a five-year license is $276,885, including tax and shipping, and this will be funded through the textbook, uh, the district textbook budget. And according with ARS 15-7, Two, one. The curriculum will be placed on display for the 60-day public review period for comment at the Melinda Romero Instructional Resource Center starting January 14th, 2021. After the 60-day review period for public comment, the curriculum will be presented for approval. Thank you, Mr. Rother. Um, are there any questions from board members or comments? I have <laughs> Again, <laughs> sorry. Sure. Um, can you tell me how um, this is going to be put up at the IRC, but it is an online curriculum. So how do they work that? So I'm going to let um, uh, Dr. Edgar uh, talk through what that process will be for the online curriculum. And she can also, if you have any specific questions about um, Quaver, you can, uh, she can respond to those as well. 
I'll, while you head to the microphone, I'll also ask the second question that I'll have is, is um, do, how much input did the uh, music general music teachers have from the elementary schools in the selection process? Both very good questions. So what we have is we have a 60-day uh, trial period that we've worked with the vendor, so we will have a laptop available. And we do this year have instructional coach, uh, Angela Story, who will be available also to answer any parent questions and help assist and navigate as well that digital piece for, for Quaver. We will have some teacher additions as well that will be pres uh, put out for display downstairs in the Melinda Romero IRC as well. Uh, in regards to the second question, you're going to have to remind me exactly what it is, Ms. Mosden. Um, uh, did the general music teachers have input into the selection of this curriculum? Yes. So first, we initially started with having um, three teachers that are our lead music teachers um, in K-6 general music. They came um, at night, as, long, as well as with two other coaches, myself, and we conducted an initial re review of the vendors that responded to the RFI and identified the top two using the rubric that was also in the RFI, moved those forward, and then we invited uh, administrators, principals, as well as all of the general education music teachers to come out and look at the top two products to create our decision, to make our decision to bring forward to you tonight. Great. Thank you very much. Thank I you. appreciate you including um, all of the general music teachers in that in that process uh, throughout the district. Thank you. Thank you. Our next is um, policy GCQA, and that's Dr. Nance. Madam President, members of the board, Chandler administration has recommended changes to policy GCQA, which is professional staff reduction in force as a result of reviewing the cur current policy. Although Chandler has not used a reduction in force policy in more than 30 years, and this policy has not been revised for 10 years, revisions are presented to include job performance as an indicator for consideration in order to ensure that a quality workforce is maintained that will be able to perform the district's educational programs. These changes are presented as information. Approval will be requested at the January 27th, 2021 board meeting. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? I have some. Mrs. Bruner? So um, I was curious if you could explain um, the inclusion, or in this case, exclusion of uh, loyalty to the district as one of the criteria for the RIF policy? So on Loyalty to the district, um, we're looking at some criteria that we can measure. Um, we're working currently with CEA to develop a rubric that will be used so we can consistently apply it across our staff. Um, and we felt like that could be a gray area that a metric could not necessarily be applied. I'm not sure I understand. So are you saying you're, you're recommending to not include that or that's I'm, still being I'm, looked at? On loyalty, are you talking loyalty to the district or, mm -hmm. or seniority in the district? Well, however you want to phrase it, people who have dedicated many years to this district, is that one of the elements you're recommending to be included? Um, we have, uh, we look at their education experience, we look at their certification that's in front of them. Um, as far as like their criteria we need for to teach specialty programs, A, B, I, B, um, highly qualified staff, um, any additional training that they've taken place that helps us run our programs. Um, the past contributions are what have they applied in their classroom. We have our student achievement data. We have our, um, now we're recommending our evaluations um, as well as um, achievements that they have in the education, as educators themselves. So no, we're not including any element that includes loyalty to the district, like years of service to the district. So years of service, um, the teacher tenured is not anything that's been in our policy, and we're not recommended that it, it be in, included as well. Almost every other school district includes it as one of the elements. It can't be <clears throat> the sole reason why someone is retained when there's a reduction in force, but we know that um, the state statutes um, make it clear that it can be included, and almost all districts do. So I'm curious what the reasoning is and what the teachers felt about that exclusion. Um, this exclusion has been in the policy for over 30 years, so it isn't something that we reached back out and asked about it with our existing staff. 
I'd like to ask if maybe we could get some feedback from teachers regarding you know what they think about this and, and what they think is valuable as well as from administration. Are there any other questions? Um, I have I have one. Has there been any thought to to asking if they have to do reduction in staff of taking volunteers uh, to go to go retire first or? Um, we're not planning on asking for volunteers, but we are looking at our retirements, resignations, and leaves first. Um, just so you're aware of a pattern. Um, we've had between 220 and 250 the past two years that have fallen into that category of retirement and resignations on leave of absences. So we're hoping that will help mitigate that number that you saw tonight. Um, we just wouldn't fill those positions. It may require that we're shifting staffing um, to the areas that are needed, um, but that would help us reduce without having to actually look at a reduction in force um, of the remaining staff. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, uh, Mr. Oh, okay, I thought you were. Let me get back to our agenda. Uh, now we are going, uh, next is the uh, board agenda roadmap. We have our next meeting on January 27th. Um, and then the next one after that on February 10th. I do believe we might be trying to schedule some um, other activities in there, but at this point they have, are not completely defined. So uh, we'll move on to superintendent comments. Dr. Castillo. Yes, Madam President, members of the board, just briefly, um, I thank the board, I know the decision you made is not, uh, was not or is not easy. Um, we haven't had and we continue not to have consensus in our community as evidenced by your emails and comments. Frankly, I look forward to the day that the decisions that you make and we make on a daily basis, um, the decisions are celebrated and applauded by our staff and our parents. And we know that's not happening tonight. So I know there's fa families that aren't very happy with us and families who are uh, very happy. So I just look forward to the day when we can please at least 95% of our families and staff. I wanna remind our, our staff and our community, we have a partnership with ASU. There is free saliva-based COVID testing at Chandler High on the weekends. Our staff has priority. If you sign up on men Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, our teachers and staff have the priority spots. On Thursday and Friday, then they open it up to the community. We're trying to get more information out uh, so that you can take that, that test to determine if, if you are uh, positive. We're also scheduling additional meeting, Dr. Gilbert and uh, Mr. Narducci are scheduling a second meeting to follow up with the staff that we met with. We anticipate we're gonna break them into the, uh, and Dr. Nance, I'm sorry, Dr. Nance and Ms. Mrs. Cooper are meeting with the support staff. We'll probably break the uh, teacher group into uh, secondary and elementary and focus on, on those issues uh, germane to those areas. We also are partnering um, in arranging for vaccines to be administered on site for our uh, staff. And they've asked for a location. And then I believe we then are given a pharmacy partner that would come and administer them. However, I know a lot of, many of our staff have already signed up and I believe there are staff that have already received the immunization and they're just, they're booked uh, moving forward. So um, I don't wanna discourage our staff from getting it now to get a head start on that three weeks that you need before you get the second one. But we are working very, very hard to uh, bring it on site here in the district so that we can uh, accommodate as many as that are willing to take it. And, I'm, and I certainly 
am going to be uh, receiving the vaccine and would encourage all our staff to do it to provide themselves that layer of protection. And that's all I have this evening. Thank you, Dr. Castile. Um, I guess I um, do, do we have, uh, you, you did mention that we were going to try and be working with a partner and have a, a pod within a, of some type of delivery system for the vaccine for our employees. Yes, we have been approved and it's a matter of working out the details. Okay. So uh, Mr. Rother is taking the lead in identifying the location and um, the time, and then we'll turn it over uh, to our health department. If there's any other kinds of scheduling details, we understand it's very low maintenance and it, the immunizations are administered by the health professionals. Do we, do we know whether these will be, if, if our staff go to um, the Chandler Gilbert place or the, or the one out in, in um, Glendale, um, will they have available the same vaccine that is being administered at those so that um, they could get, possibly get the second shot here or do we not know that information yet? Go ahead. Uh uh, President Mazin, we have uh, a conference call tomorrow with this, uh, I think, 22 districts that have been identified to host a pod. And so we'll know more after that meeting, hopefully tomorrow, about what, what vaccination it is, um, if it's the new Moderna vaccination that you only need a, apparently one shot for, or can it be the second? Oh, you still need two. So it, it will really just uh, sort of depend on, on um, that conversation and what they're uh, going to offer to us to be able to distribute right here <clears throat> at Chandler. Thank you. Yep. Are there any board member comments? Mr. Alla? Um, I would just like to say uh, thank you to everybody that cared enough to write in to us and send us your email and put your comments on the, the website the, that was set up. We actually read your emails. I, I tried to respond to a couple of them and, and and just say thanks for your comments, but uh, we don't have time to write back to every single one, but we do actually listen. Um, we do actually read these things. Um, hopefully this couple of weeks worth of break has got us past a spike in, in uh, COVID cases that would have been bad to have kids in, in school with, and uh, everybody take care of each other as you get back into class. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olive. Do we have someone else? I, Mr. Worth? I, I've had two board meetings and I can't imagine any tougher decisions in my career that I've made. Just looking forward to a brighter future. Thank you, I agree. So um, with that, I will adjourn the meeting and we'll see you next time. <laughs>